let me tell you about a patient. This uh, is a six-year-old girl, happy and healthy, uh, did, played sports, loved by her family, lovely child, and uh, two days later, she's dying. She developed H1N1 influenza, complicated by streptococcus. She's in septic shock. Uh, she has barely viable vital signs. Her x-ray looks like this, and, and she's very, very sick. Her name is Serena Roll. Uh, she's going to die in about 24 hours or sooner. For our previous speaker, you might decide whether you want to offer her CPR or not. But it, it as you know, only works about 5% of the time anyway. Uh, but you can look at her and, and you know, her doctor knows that she has, has a 10% or less chance of surviving for a day. Uh, an extracorporeal life support device known as ECLS or ECMO is available in Better General Hospital. It's about 100 miles away. ECMO has a pretty good chance of saving her life, but it's complicated, it's expensive, uh, it's unproven, depending on what source of evidence you're looking for. What should you do? Suppose you're her mother or her father or or grandmother or grandfather looking around the audience. What, what do you want done? Do you, do, you, do you say this is futile, why are we doing this? We're so sorry, but you know, she's only six and she'll die and that'll be it. Of course not, you're going to say, please do everything you can to save my daughter. Uh, what's the chance that she's gonna be normal after the treatment? Oh yes, that's what we want, please do it. No matter what, how much does it cost, I don't care. Suppose you're her doctor. You're there in your intensive care unit and you're, you're now faced with a series of uh, decisions. So you know about ECMO, you know about Better General Hospital. It's called Better General Hospital for a reason. It's better than your hospital, they think. You don't think so. They're doing this thing, you're not. Do you lose credibility? Do you lose face? Do you lose the patient? If you call Better General Hospital, do you tell them, I've done all I can do and this kid's gonna die? And if you do that, should you tell the family? They don't know. Should you tell them, you know, there is this treatment that's available, but it's 100 miles away and, you know, it's Saturday afternoon and da 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 Should you even contact Better General Hospital to admit that you're at the end of your rope and even though you run the world's greatest ICU, uh, maybe they have something better? Hard thing to admit for intensive care docs. And if you do all those things, then, then the question is, what are the risks versus the benefits? This, this machine has a lot of risks to it. Patient can bleed to death, they can bleed into their head, all kinds of things can go on. And if you're the doctor, you know about this, maybe you've read about it in the literature, maybe you heard a talk somewhere. So you uh, decide what should be done, if you think about it. You can't ask the family to make that decision. They don't know much more than you do about it. So you form an opinion. Okay, Saturday afternoon, should I call them up? Should I have them come here? Should I send the kid there? Uh, or should I just not bring it up, you know, because I'm doing the best that anybody could do right here? And should you form that opinion and then use that opinion to advise the family who's going to say, please do whatever you can do, doesn't matter what it costs. Suppose you do that, how about the timing? How about the transportation? This needs to be done the next few hours of time. Is it reasonable to do that? And who's gonna pay for it? And uh, not only that, who's not gonna pay for that patient once you send them out of your hospital? Insurance company gonna pay the referral hospital, not you. That, that, that could be a problem. So th those are the dilemmas facing the treating physician. We're not gonna talk about that, but I want you to remember that when we talk about what we're really here to talk about, which is developing that evidence. How do you study a complex procedure uh, or device or a drug in acute fatal illness? That means exactly that, a, a disease from which that person's gonna die today or tomorrow. Very different than studying two different antibiotics or two different drugs for rheumatoid arthritis and so on. The clinical research is a very different problem than it is in, in most other kinds of clinical research. 
how do you conduct a study? And at the end of it, is that evidence going to convince a skeptical expert audience of people who would consider that research a little weird, a little wild stuff? And the end point of the trial is death. It's not, do your joints hurt? It's not, have you got better from this infection? It's, are you dead or alive this week? So it's not quite like any other situation in clinical research when you think about it. There are others like this, and I'll tell you about them. Uh, suppose that uh, this thing you're going to study has been thoroughly studied in animals and has quite good results, and suppose there are 10 or 100 or 1,000 cases reported in which the results are really pretty encouraging in patients like your little girl. So how do you do uh, clinical studies of any type? They're listed here, but particularly in life support in which the endpoint is death. So uh, historical controls are you can compare to a database. For certain kinds of clinical trials, that's all you need. Everyone who gets cancer of the pancreas dies. If you had a treatment where 90% survived, no, you don't need to study that. That works, right? Uh, in, in acute fatal illness that's not a malignant disease, uh, the, every doc will say, well, if I took care of that patient, they'll get through this. I, I, no one ever dies in my ICU. That's the skeptical audience. So you get into contemporary controls. You're going to compare treatment with this device to similar patients who, who aren't going to get it. But imagine the problem there of doing a, a trial, various ways to do it. You could randomize the patients uh, in your hospital and either send them to better general or, or not. Or you could randomize the patients within your own hospital, but this patient in the ICU is going to get this treatment, this patient's not. How is that going to work? So there have been, in fact, a lot of clinical trials of life support technology, things that if you don't do them, the patient's going to die quickly. Uh, CPR is a good example, or uh, dialysis, or transplantation of any organ, or ventricular assist devices, defibrillators, septic shock, even ECMO. All these things have been studied in phase one trials. None of them, except ECMO, has been studied in a phase two or three clinical comparative trial. Why is that? No one's, ever, no one's ever studied mechanical ventilation. What happens if you don't intubate, put them on the ventilator? That's never been studied. There's no evidence. And the reason is, well, the evidence is better to be alive than dead. Give me a break here, right? But, uh, but suppose the thing you do to make the patient alive rather than dead is complicated, expensive, and by and large, unproven. So the only prospective trials or the only comparative trials that have been done on any life support technique have been done with this technology called ECMO. And I've been lucky or not lucky to be involved with all of those trials that have been done since the beginning of this technology in 1971. So I've learned a lot about this issue of, of how to study a life support system in which the end point is death in acute fatal illness. Uh, we'll talk about various ways to do this, randomized trials, adaptive design randomized trials, and matched pairs type of trials. What ECMO is, is this. It's support of heart and or lung function with mechanical devices, which is temporary, days to weeks, nowadays to months, can be partial or total support, uh, keeps the rest of the body alive while those vital organs don't work, but more importantly, avoids ongoing iatrogenic injury. You don't need to ventilate the patient with 100% oxygen, high pressure ventilation. You don't need to give them eight of the latest high-powered anhydrotropes or other type drugs, and simply sustains life while bridging to recovery or nowadays to transplantation in some cases. The indications to do it are easy to define, acute severe cardiac or pulmonary failure, unresponsive to optimal management, in which recovery could be expected in two to four weeks. Now, nowadays, we'd probably say two months of time, but that's about the amount of time you can do this without having fatal complications from the treatment itself. Now, the, 
the first patient treated successfully with this technology was in Santa Barbara, California, by a surgeon named Don Hill. Uh, and uh, Don's a friend of mine. We helped him put this together. Uh, actually, I took this photograph of this young man, the first patient to survive. He had severe uh, respiratory failure following trauma and uh, had a ruptured aorta, had some broken bones. They fixed all that. He wound up with severe ARDS. And, the, and this Don came down from San Francisco and put this patient on the ECMO machine. And what you see, all that stuff you see is the ECMO machine of that time. We didn't call it that back then. This patient recovered. So that, uh, that patient led to another, then another, then another. And uh, some of you may remember that in the early 70s, uh, there was a new diagnosis, ARDS, acute respiratory failure. It was called Vietnam lung or Danan lung or congestive atelectasis. It was just really bad respiratory failure following shock trauma, sepsis, pneumonia, things like that. So uh, after this and about 20 or 30 other cases like this, uh, the NIH uh, impaneled a series of centers to do a prospective randomized trial of this technology because ARDS was this huge problem. It just suddenly erupted. I mean, it's always been around, but it had a name now, and everyone was worried about it, and most of those people died. So it was seen as a crisis, and the lung division of NIH said, we're going to conduct a, a trial. So they uh, convened, they put out an RFP, people responded to it. There were nine centers around the country that participated in this trial. We sat in a meeting room in Bethesda and designed the trial. Uh, and these are the results of the trial. So I'm sorry, this pointer only points to one screen over here. So this is the, the, the study was powered for 300 patients. Uh, this study was stopped after um, uh, about a hundred about 90 patients actually because of futility uh, these are all the patients in the nine study centers who had the diagnosis of ARDS 65% of them died that was a big surprise no one realized the mortality that was involved with severe respiratory failure these are the patients in the control group who had ARDS but were really sick with it, and they, they all died, 10% ultimately survived. These are the ECMO patients. They're on for a week. Uh, they lived during that week, but because the trial said we're gonna stop it after a week, uh, and what do you know, 10% died. And so this study was published, and the conclusion was, well, we studied that technology. It doesn't work. We saved the country a lot of money and a lot of patients, a lot of grief. Alan Morris, who is a, a, a intensivist in Salt Lake City, uh, did an in-center study studying a variation of ECMO called extracorporeal CO2 removal. At this trial, 40 patients met the criteria, were randomized to keep doing what they were doing or to add in ECMO and there were after uh, a brief number of patients, there was no difference so they stopped the trial for futility and reported this saying, we tried it a different way, it doesn't work. So uh, what, what can we learn from those trials that were done in the 70s? Well, these are things that were not done but should have been done. So it's important to characterize the study population before you start entering into a significant comparative trial. It's important to standardize the conventional treatment. It's important to characterize and standardize the new treatment. And then you should expect that people are gonna be doing both the conventional treatment and the new treatment to demonstrate that they're good at it, that they could really do it. None of those things were done in those trials. And uh, as a result, uh, the the conclusions were incorrect, in my opinion, but, uh, but the, nonetheless, those studies are published and everyone adopted those studies. So the other lesson we learned is that doing a comparative trial of a new technology badly or doing it prematurely can be deleterious to clinical practice and, and science. And ECMO for ARDS went away for about 20, about 20 years, except in a very few small centers. 
1975, we were one of the centers involved in, in this trial. There were nine centers. Only three of them had ever seen an ECMO machine before the trial started. You can imagine the problem. But at any rate, we were using this technology in, in, in our hospital. We were the pediatric surgeons as well as the general and cardiac surgeons. So we were called to the neonatal ICU to see this baby who's dying of meconium aspiration. Would we want to try our device and, and see what it does to newborn infants where the mortality was quite high for severe respiratory failure in a newborn? Uh, we, <laughs> We did that. Uh, we, as my surgical partner and I, a wonderful guy named Al Gazaniga, so uh, we went over, we consulted the IRB. That was us. Think we ought to do this? Yeah, let's do this. What, why not? <laughs> so we did. And uh, this, this child, whose his name was Esperanza, survived. It was the first neonatal survivor, and in fact, followed by another, another, another. So it turned out that this technology was very uh, effective for newborn infants with respiratory failure. Now, this is a diagram of the system, and those of you who've been involved with cardiac surgery recognize just a stripped down heart and lung machine. We drain blood from the right atrium, pump it through a membrane lung, and back into the patient, in this case, uh, from the right atrium to the aorta, and support heart and lung function for a period of time which then was measured in days before there were fatal complications. And what do you know, it worked pretty well. So we had more and more survivors and um, by, by the uh, early 80s, we had developed measurement techniques. We knew we could detect 90% mortality risk in a newborn baby. We knew we could get survival 90% of the time if we use this device. But uh, how, how are we going to study that? Uh, most, most, we're surgeons. Most neonatologists in the world say, you know what they're doing at Michigan? Those crazy guys, they're hooking poor babies up to this machine. Oh my God, it's unethical. It's malpractice, terrible thing to do. So uh, we're now faced with a dilemma of doing a, a clinical trial with a control group that would be convincing to all of our friends who are experts in the field and skeptical. We knew that this would work 90% of the time. We knew that 90% of the patients in the control group would die. So we have a, a, a problem. How are we going to conduct this trial when we know those are the ballpark numbers we're going to deal with? So we had a problem, and everyone in the hospital had a problem with just assigning babies to the control group because we knew they were all going to die. So uh, we used a, tech, uh, a technique called adaptive randomization. So another way to do a randomized trial is to modify the randomization as it goes along, which favors the more favorable treatment, whatever that is. Never been used for any trial, but it had been used for things like if you have a scalp laceration, you sew it up in the emergency room, should you give antibiotics or not? So you give antibiotics to one person, and, and then if that works, you give it again and again. If it doesn't work, you give it to the next person. That's what a, that's what a, a uh, what called play the winner trial is. But we wanted to do it randomized, because if you knew what the treatment was going to be, it would change your approach. So we used a technology called randomized play the winner. Uh, and it starts like this. There's a 50-50 chance of getting treatment A or B, and if the, pa and it's a, the end point here is death, so if the patient survives, you add another white ball, and the odds are two to one of getting the white ball when you reach in again. Uh, if a uh, next patient dies, you add a blue ball, and so on. And so what happens is you accumulate patients in two arms of the study until you reach statistical significance, so it addresses a little bit the problems of the ethics and the logistics because the better treatment uh, will, you'll determine that if it really is better in a fairly, fairly quick time. So here are the results of that trial which was published in 84. There were 50 uh, babies who were greater than two kilograms birth weight who had severe respiratory failure. Most of them got better with conventional care, 36. 14 of them did not and met the criteria for the trial Two of those were not entered into the trial because of exclusion criteria. 
I'll tell you what it was in a minute. And so 12 were randomized. So the, the first patient went on ECMO and survived. The second patient did not go on and died. And then the third and fourth patient, they all survived. So we kept adding more white balls to the urn in the parlance of statisticians. So we reached seven patients. The statistician called me up and said, you're there, you've reached statistical significance. Whatever A is, it's better than B, he didn't know. I said, no one's gonna believe it. I got seven patients in the trial and only one patient in the control group. What can I do? He said, well, you just keep doing, keep doing it and, and uh, add numbers to your p-value. So when we got to 12 patients, treatment A was better than B with a p-value of seven zeros one. So we thought, okay, this, this is really this is good. So we proved the principle and uh, set out to publish this paper. Most journals didn't want to publish it, uh, but eventually it was published with a lot of ed letters to the editor criticizing the methodology. And uh, one of the most vocal groups was from the Boston Children's Hospital, which from my point of view, where all this, where we started this stuff years before. So they said, well, I said, okay, well you do a randomized trial. Okay, well they had the same results we did in their unit, so they couldn't convince anyone to do a standard randomized trial in which half the patients are gonna go into the control group. So they used this type of an adaptive design. Uh, they, they had, uh, patients who uh, met criteria for the trial, met entry criteria, and randomized them. And they randomized them by a coin flip until there were four deaths in one group. That's the way the trial was designed. And there were four deaths in the conventional treatment group. Uh, and so they, at, and at that time, with this type of adaptive design, then you, can keep, you continue the other treatment, whatever it is, happened to be ECMO, until you've reached statistical significance, which so they did uh, a lot more patients and it reached statistical significance at, at, uh, at a, the total number of patients that you see there. Uh, so they, they uh, published that trial. Well, people were still unconvinced. Well, well, you know, it's kind of a weird way to do a randomized trial and stuff. Um, the, the statisticians love this. They think this is really great. In a small number of patients, you've answered a difficult question in a life support technique. Clinicians didn't believe this at all. Uh, so it didn't, it didn't solve, solve much of a problem, but it was an interesting approach to the, to the question. It's never been used since then. Now, we, one, from the ethical point of view, when, when we did the first adaptive design trial, uh, we got consent for those patients who were randomized to ECMO. So uh, we had patients and they met criteria, they're randomized to ECMO, and we'd give them the ECMO consent, which was pages long, all these bad things can happen to you, so on and so forth. Uh, and that was it. When, when uh, the Boston group did this study of just a couple of years later, uh, they, they did the same thing. They just got consent for the innovative treatment because the patient had already consented for getting standard treatment. Um, they were roundly criticized and in fact had their entire governmental support withdrawn for a couple of months because uh, they withheld a good treatment from a lot of patients and let them die just because they were in the trial and they hadn't consented for it. So some of you who study this stuff know this is, this is the issue studied by a man named Zellin who said if you're studying standard treatment compared to something different, you only need to get consent for what's different. Now all of you ethicists are having angina by now, but that's the way it was in the 80s. So of course nowadays you'd probably want to get consent to enter into the trial at all, but now imagine the problem. I'm sorry, uh, Grandpa, your little baby is randomized to the control group, but can't I get that fancy? No, no, we, you're randomized. Well, wait, what, I, I don't, what if I don't consent for it? Well, that's a problem. Maybe we'll have to use it anyway. You can imagine the, the problems that went. So the lessons we learned from these uh, adaptive design uh, approaches are listed here. And we had learned before how to do the first couple things, so we did that. We characterized the population and standardized both the conventional treatment and the innovative treatment. And we expected that you had to demonstrate competence in both critical care and in critical care plus 
ECMO. And we also learned that uh, you really should get consent to the trial, to the conventional treatment, as well as the inter intervention. It's really not necessary from the statistician's point of view, but it's wise to do. If nothing else, it'll keep you out of the Boston Globe. And we also learned that statisticians thought this was brilliant, and clinicians thought it was really stupid. So it hasn't been used since then, but something we might return to. Remember, the end point in these trials is death, so, so that drives the urgency of it. So a different type of uh, randomized trial was conducted in the United Kingdom in which they had, I'm oh, sorry, 30 neonatal ICUs. Uh, involved and this was powered for 300 patients uh, and ended uh, for success after 180 patients but what happened was that babies in uh, various neonatal ICUs around the country were randomized if the families agreed to stay where they were and get the best available conventional treatment or to go to one of four ECMO centers and get treated there. And the, the end result of the trial was, uh, is listed here. Uh, a little more survival in the control group than we would have expected because of the Hawthorne effect. Everybody, you can't blind this. Everybody knows that baby's in the trial. Oh my gosh, get the, preferably not the chief attending, they haven't been there, but the chief resident will come in and twiddle the knobs on the ventilator. Uh, and so, they did a little better. Patients in the ECMO group did worse than we thought because five of those babies died during transport, which is part of the risk. So you have to include it in intention to treat trial. So, so uh, you would think that that pretty well answered the question, and it did for most neonatologists. Uh, about that time, we did another trial here at, at Michigan, which was a trial of early versus late application of this complicated technology, because it does have risks of its own bleeding and so on. Uh, so that we had, by this time, we had developed metrics that allowed us to quantitate mortality risk, and that's what this OI25 refers to. The normal value is zero, 25 is about 50% mortality, 40 was 80% mortality. So we uh, randomized with consent uh, patients to either uh, go on to ECMO at an early stage when the risk of dying was only 50% to staying on conventional care and if they got to the point where they were failing on conventional care they could go on to ECMO. Not, not all did. So uh, uh, a way of addressing, in this case, a practical problem. When should you use it? Not should you, but uh, should you use it as a last ditch treatment or would it be better if you started earlier? Uh, the results of that trial are shown here. The, the early ECMO patients were in the hospital a shorter time, had less expense in the hospital compared to the patients in the control group, especially the patients who never had ECMO and and uh, still survived, even though there was no difference in survival, and the neurodevelopmental injury was uh, considerably less in the patients who went on ECMO early compared to those who never went on at all. Uh, a very useful finding for us. The group in the UK who did the neonatal trial uh, did a similar trial for adult respiratory failure. Uh, here, this, this is um, two and a half decades after the, after the ill-fated trial sponsored by the NIH. And they ran it just like the neonatal trial. They recruited a lot of very good ICUs, each of which thought they're God's gift to intensive care. They got consent with patients who met criteria, and uh, they were randomized to either stay in that center and get what they considered optimal therapy, or whether they would go to one ECMO Center, which is in Leicester, England, very good place, they're really good at it. And these are the uh, results of that trial. Uh, the survival rate was about 70% versus 50% uh, in the two groups, statistically significant, and you'd think that that would convince uh, adult intensivists, um, but still hasn't. This is still a work in, in progress. So those are all the trials that have been done on this technology. Not all of them, I'll tell you about a few more, but uh, all the ones that lead us to 
getting down to the point where we've learned something about how to design a trial in acute fatal illness in which the endpoint is death. So we talked about characterizing the population, standardizing the technology, making sure you're good at it, getting consent for the trial. So you do all of that, then how would you design the trial itself? What are the entry criteria? That's pretty easy. You're real sick with cardiac or respiratory failure. Uh, what are the exclusion criteria? What if you have a head injury? What if you have Down syndrome? That was the exclusion for two babies in our, in our early trial. Down syndrome, it's not worth investing. And imagine how things have changed over time. Imagine if you have a malignancy and just happen to have pneumonia, things like that. So designing the exclusion criteria can be difficult, but it's going to affect the interpretation of that trial. Because someone will say, well, they didn't really put patients with comorbidities on it. You have to get consent to be sure, but consent to what? Consent to use the, the new device, sure enough. Consent to the study. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's okay, but what if the family declines? They say, look, I, I want my little six-year-old girl to get that thing. I don't care what science you're doing. Uh, I don't agree to this study. Or once I, what happens if I get in the study and I randomize to control? and say, well, that's what we're going to do. No, then I, can I withdraw and use the thing anyway? Oh, yes, you can do that. That's autonomy. There's one of the bioethical buzzwords. So it really complicates doing a trial like this in which the end point is death and you have to make decisions really, really quickly. What are the incentives for the family, for the treating doctor, for the investigator who's in there? The investigator is going to get paid for this. The, the uh, Family might not have any money. Who's going to pay for it? Uh, is there a coercion to join the trial? Sure. If you don't join the trial, you're not going to get this thing. I'm sorry, Grandpa, but you have to agree to that sign here. And how are we going to deal with the patients that are in the control group if they want to withdraw from the trial, try something new, go to better general hospital instead of where you are to get, to get that treatment? How do you deal with that when you design the trial? Of course, you have to learn the technique, but it's going to change. Both conventional care and the technology is going to change during the three years you're doing the trial. Along comes inhaled nitric oxide. Oh my gosh, the different playing field. How do you correct for that in the course of doing the trial? And finally, death is the end point. You'd think that's easy. That's not easy at all. How do you, how do you define death? Uh, in, in the original NIH trial, there was a crossover built in, what they called de jure, what we call, that was part of it, de jure death. Everybody knows you'd be dead if you're this level of sick, so you can go ahead and use the other treatment, whatever that is, and you can imagine the statistical problems in doing that. When do you stop the treatment? Uh, if, the, if the lungs are not recovered and you turn it off, that patient's gonna die, but did you give it an adequate trial? How do you know? Uh, should you have done that? When do you stop the study? There are stopping rules for every type of study like this. We're going to reach significance or we're going to have declare futility. Uh, but in fact, the doctor is controlling when you stop the treatment based on his opinion of how the patient's doing. You have to write protocols for that. They really don't work very well. And what if, uh, how do you deal with worse than death outcomes? A patient has really severe brain damage. He's going to spend the rest of their life in an institution with no interaction with the world, except they're going to be there 40 years. How do you deal with that issue while you're going along? And those are, those are the study design. How about the practical problems? Who's going to pay for this? This is really expensive. Insurance companies are very proud to say they will not pay for experimental treatments. So what's experimental? Bone marrow transplantation in breast cancer. You might remember that came up a few years ago. Every woman in the world who had end-stage breast cancer sued their insurance company because they wouldn't pay for mega chemo and bone marrow transplant until a study came out saying it doesn't do any good. But so someone had to do that, that study to prove the point. In the meantime, a lot of us spent a whole lot of money on doing it. That's why these big randomized trials are done in the UK, United Kingdom, because they have a single payer system. And so the argument to the National Health Service from these ECMO centers was we can get more survivors with less expense than conventional treatment. And that was the, it was the economic argument that convinced the government to pay for the trial. 
Here in the United States, we deal with FDA. I haven't even talked about them yet. I'll just tell you it's a nightmare. And we are about 10 years behind the rest of the world in advanced science because of the FDA. Not their fault, but, but someone's going to sue them if they approve a device or a drug that doesn't work once. And you, you can see the, if, if you wonder why our drugs cost 10 times more than they do in Canada, that's by and large the reason you have to do a $50, $500 million study to prove that the drug works. According to us, we don't believe the dumb Canadians. And then how are we going to interpret the study? I showed you some examples. You've got to get someone to publish it. Uh, what if the editors say, this is too, too wild. If you publish this, people are all really going to start doing this. We don't want to be responsible for that. That's what happened in our, all of our initial trials. How about the legal issues? What if, what if grandpa says, you must use this treatment. I'm going to sue you if you don't do it. So it and, you know, it's here in your hospital, there's a protocol, how do you deal with that? You do it and there's a bad result, now you're going to get sued for a bad result. Who's going to deal with that? Uh, it's interesting that some of the really important principles of bioethics do not apply to this deal of designing and conducting a randomized trial or any kind of a trial in acute fatal illness. Uh, equipoise? No equipoise. The person's going to be dead, so this is something that will keep them alive. Everyone knows that, so that's worth there's no equipoise involved, even though people say, well, I'm not sure if it works or not. You know, you're dead or you're not. That's pretty simple. Justice. Why don't we just do, give this to everybody who needs it? That's what mom wants to do. That's what the treating docs want to do. Well, wait a minute, because it costs and so on. And beneficence. We're going to do the best thing we can do for our patients. That's right there. So here's a patient randomized control group. Can I deal with that? When I sit in a study room in Bethesda and we're designing the trial, we can say, sure, that's easy. When I'm there at the bedside taking care of a patient, it's not easy at all. So the investigator clinician uh, appears to have a moral dilemma. You have an obligation to the patient. You also uh, have an obligation to conduct the trial. And in fact, you're getting paid to conduct the trial. So is that a conflict of interest? I, I always say there's no such thing as a conflict of interest. There's shared interest. We have a shared interest in this patient getting better. We're, we're, uh, but it may be that I you know, own the company that makes the device, which I don't, which I did, which I did. So an approach to that uh, dilemma is this, doing sequential or matched pairs trials. These are trials in which the study cohort is uh, compared to a data cohort of some type, usually a contemporary uh, cohort of data, and you match patients with the new treatment, whatever it is, uh, to patients from the control group based on age, gender, severity of illness, diagnosis, and other comorbidities and things like that. And uh, statistically, it's a very strong way to proceed if you can convince yourself and everyone else that those groups are really similar to start with, which is not hard to do, but you can, from a big database, you can match your study patients two to one, three to one, four to one from the database. And I'll show you a couple of examples. Uh, this is a trial that was conducted in the Netherlands in 1995, a newborn ECMO. Will Haven was the investigator. And uh, the, the, the country of Holland is fairly small, and uh, there's only one payer. It's a, it's, a, it's a totally socialized system. So they could, and they also are very good at data collection. So they, they know exactly what happens to every patient who gets sick and in, in Holland and how much it costs to take care of them and what the outcomes are and stuff like that. Uh, so they uh, compared two groups in this fashion. Uh, group one was all those babies who met the criteria for ECMO between 1988 and 19. 91. In all of their controlled ICUs, there were 84 such patients. And group two was, they instituted ECMO, I think, in three centers and, and then looked at all the patients in those centers over the next two years of time, 92 to 94. So group one was before the uh, ECMO management and group two was with it. And uh, th those uh, uh, letters there describe the conditions that cause respiratory failure in the newborn, meconium aspiration, diaphragmatic hernia, and other problems, sepsis, and, and IRDS, and the like. 
So you can see there were similar numbers in both groups, similar numbers of the diagnoses, and the uh, survival rate is shown in the next column, 32% before they instituted ECMO, 80% afterward. So they concluded, okay, that was, uh, we saved some lives with that. And uh, not only that, they had data on the cost. So for each meconium aspiration survivor, it was going to cost their payer system $25,000, up to 85 for a diaphragmatic hernia and so on. So they could make a decision, uh, are we going to offer this technology? And if so, what's it going to cost us to do it? Because the patients in the control group, of course, died sooner, didn't cost as much. Here's another example of a real match pairs trial. In the, in the 90s, uh, Tom Green and Tim Timmons, who were pediatric intensivists, did this trial. They uh, recruited 32 pediatric ICUs, not neonatal, just pediatric, and uh, got them to uh, give, a, give a snapshot of all the patients in that year who had severe respiratory failure defined in this way. There were uh, 679 patients. And then they did a big multivariate analysis on that group to determine what factors were associated with outcome. Uh, there were two predictor scores that sure enough predicted outcome, either survival or death, with a high significance, the PRISM score and the oxygenation index that I referred to earlier. There was one physiologic variable, which was PCO2, uh, and one treatment variable, which was ECMO. So the ECMO treated patients out of the 680 patients in the multivariate analysis looked like they did better than the, the patients who were not on ECMO, but there weren't many of them. So then they took those patients, there were 53 of them, and conducted a match pairs analysis to all the other 600 and some patients in the trial, matched for age, gender, diagnosis, severity of illness, and so on. In a pediatric ICU, this is really important because in a peds ICU, you have a 30-day-old infant with RSV, an 18-year-old who got hit by a truck, and Serena Roll, who's six-year-old and has pneumonia, and everything in between. So imagine if you were gonna just randomize all those, you'd have to do 2,000 patients in a group to reach significance because there's such diversity. With the match pairs trial, you could match each treated patient to a patient from the database who was very, very similar and proved that they, they were similar and these were the results of that trial. Look at all the problems that they solved here. Uh, there's, there's not a consent problem except they consulted for, consented for ECMO. They consented to have their data used for other stuff. Everybody does that. If you, if you go into a hospital, you're going to sign a data form. Uh, they solved a lot of the ethical issues, they solved a lot of the logistic issues, uh, and came up with a very good statistical analysis. Just a couple more examples. In, in 2009, you might remember, we had the worldwide pandemic of influenza with the swine flu virus. It wasn't uh, a very virulent virus. It didn't kill many people, but it was very contagious. Lots of people got it. So the 1% who got really sick got really sick in a hurry, and they died in a hurry like the little girl that I'm telling you about. Australia did this uh, six months before everyone in the Northern Hemisphere hit there first because their winter was our summer. So they are very good at collecting data. So they uh, studied this epidemic in Australia and New Zealand. They had uh, in that group 201 patients with severe respiratory failure in 15 ECMO centers. 68 of those patients were not improving on their version of conventional management. The average patient had been on the ventilator only two days and is really sick, as you can see from these numbers. And so they went on to ECMO, and at the end of it all, this is not randomized, this is just taking care of sick people as fast as you can, 77% of those patients survived to hospital discharge. Really good results for adults with ARDS, kind of unprecedented. So everyone in the Northern Hemisphere took a look at this. This is a phase one trial. This is just historical controls. And every civilized country north of the Equator developed a way to deal with this. We did in the United States. We had about 300 ECMO patients and, uh, during that time and so on. So this is just background to point out that the, the group in the UK, similar, similar group, they're really good at this, had data on, in their H1N1 epidemic. Uh, 
and they had four really good ECMO centers and data on about a thousand patients or something like that that were sick. So there were 69 patients who were on ECMO and they did a match pairs trial matching them to other patients from their database. Now there are many ways to match patients and they, they use three of them, individual matching, what's called propensity score and gen match, a computerized way of matching patient. Point is they could pick two patients out of their database for every one ECMO patients who were similarly ill when they started and see what happened to them over time. And as you can see, the, the results were 70 some percent uh, survival compared to about 50% for the, for the matched pairs group. So again, a good way to answer a difficult question, avoiding a lot of the problems that come up when you're doing a clinical research study in acute fatal illness. Uh, one last example that I'll tell you because we're so proud about this. The, there's a device called the Berlin Heart. That's the name of the company and it's also the name of the device. It's a artificial heart for children. It's the only one available in the world that works pretty well as, as a way to treat children who have severe heart failure, particularly as a bridge to transplantation. And uh, the, F, the Berlin Heart Company wanted to get this device for sale in the United States. And uh, the FDA, to their incredible credit, recommended to them that they do a match pairs trial against the ECMO database, because ECMO is the only other life support system for severe heart failure in children. Uh, and so we, they, they, we conducted this study, but they only needed 48 patients in their trial compared to two to one matching. So 96 patients out of the database was already finished. And as you can see, 90% of the patients on the Berlin Heart survived and 66% of the ECMO patients. Now we knew that was gonna be the result. This device works great. But the alternative, the FDA would always in the past require them to do a randomized trial in the United States. So they would have to take their 48 patients and have 48 patients in the control group who they just didn't offer it to whatever happened to them. And they're facing the same ethical and moral and financial dilemmas that, that we had all faced over the last three decades. So, so this was the first ever trial uh, in which the FDA allowed comparison of a radical intervention to a database and it was very successful. So we're, we're happy with that. So the, in, in conclusion, the things that we've learned from this uh, experience are listed here, characterize the standardized, the conventional, the new treatments, demonstrate competence. Uh, the investigator clinician is always gonna be in a terrible dilemma. You wanna do the best you can for your patient, but you're involved with the trial. So that's just gonna happen. And it's resolved by personal integrity. You're just a good doctor. You're gonna do what you think is the right thing for your patient. And finally, the match pair study design is, is far and away the best from my point of view and the way that these studies in acute fatal illness should be done in the future. It's the best comparison of one patient group to another. It minimizes the problems of ethics and consent and logistics in, in many ways. And it's far and away the most efficient. You can reach a conclusion based on the smallest number of patients. So, um, I was uh, going to tell you where this technology stands today. This is the current database from ELSO. There's some 50,000 patients in the registry. Uh, little Serena is listed here. She's pediatric respiratory failure. The overall survival from the beginning of the registry is 56%, for example. Um, this is Esperanza, that first baby that we treated back in 1975. She's as uh, shown here at the age of 21, she's now 37 and has three children of her own, and so on. Uh, as far as Serena goes, the news is not always good. This is her x-ray after a month on ECMO. Now, I should tell you that when we first started this, if the patient didn't get better for a week, we just turned it off. We said, this is irreversible lung damage, it's not gonna work. Then that went on to, 14 days, in most centers now it's at 14 days. If the lung hasn't recovered in that period of time, it's, it's not going to, so we turn it off, patient dies, they go to 
autopsy and the pathologist says this tissue is terrible, it's never going to get better. But in a few centers we've, we've learned more about acute lung injury. So here she is with no air going in out of her lungs on day 32. Here's day 40. What do you know? She just got better. So uh, we're learning a lot about, about the reversibility or irreversibility of, of acute organ failure, in this case the lung, but the same is true for the heart, the kidney, and the liver, and so on. So uh, she ultimately recovered, and here she is on the day she was going home. So a bit of a sojourn through uh, acute fatal illness and how to study it, and I'll uh, conclude with that and answer any questions if you have.